Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Fair Housing Person Who Are Immigrant Listening Session. My name is Douglas Strong. I'm the Fair Housing Manager too within the Housing Policy Development Division. I have been with ACD since 2018 in various positions. For those who may find it difficult to see me on your screen, I would like to describe myself. I have black hair, dark brown eyes. Two days, my hair is slicked back. I'm wearing a button up dark green dress shirt and I have a black headset. I just wanna let you know that we have a group of folks from ACD Fair Housing team with us today, but your presenter would be myself, Douglas and Veronica Katayama. For today's listening session, we would like to go over a few community standards and encourage an opening and productive dialogue. If you wish to speak, please raise your Zoom hand by clicking on raise hand icon located at the bottom of your screen, and we will enable the ability to unmute your microphone so you can share your thoughts. Please use the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen to share comments. If you want to stay anonymous, choose that option when writing your message. Also, the Q&A name doesn't quite fit this session because we won't be answering questions. We're here to listen to your input. We will, we will be asking you some questions at the end of the presentation. Be mindful of different style of communication and learning. Recognize that some of us are external processor who think out loud, while others are internal processor who need time to reflect before contributing. Be mindful of space you occupy in conversations, allow others to participate. Be curious. Embrace the opportunity to learn from one another. If someone shares something new or unfamiliar, stay curious. Take notes of their comments and revisit them later for further exploration. Use I statement. During today's listening session, when sharing your thoughts or experience, please use I statements. This approach fosters a non-defensive atmosphere and encourages constructive dialogue. For example, say, I don't understand. Can you please rephrase instead of saying you don't make sense? Help us explore and develop the fair housing impediments. Your firsthand or secondhand knowledge of Im immigration experience can help shape or go for addressing impediments in the upcoming five year cycle. If you choose not to speak today, or if you think of something you'd like to share at a later point, you can always email us at AI Fair Housing Report at acd.ca.gov. We will begin by sharing an overview of the AI update timeline and our public engage engagement plan. Then we'll talk briefly about fair housing. Next, we'll discuss current trends and existing conditions in California regarding immigration. Finally, we will provide you with some questions and open up for discussion. We will also launch the question as polls so that you can enter your type respond that way if you choose. The AI team held a kickoff webinar on January 4th, 2024, and we are currently in the listening session and webinar phase of the timeline. By March 20th, we will conduct a total of six listening sessions, including this one and two previously held as well as two webinars. Registration link and, uh, for this event were included in the e-blast and reminder will be sent prior to each listening session to encourage registrations. Additionally, registration links are available on ACD website. At the same time, we are seeking feedback through our community needs assessment survey until April 1st. For, uh, following this, we will work to finalize our report we plan to open uh, the public comments period and hold hearings from mid-July to mid-August of 2024. Uh, and with the final version scheduled to be uh, public at the end of August. You don't need to memorize any, everything on this slide. It is just an overview of our upcoming event. We will promote them through eBlast, social media, and our website. The listening session we'll be conducting cover a variety of topics. We have already completed session on homelessness on January 30th, 31st, 
and Disability and Aging Population listening session on February 7. Today's discussion focuses on persons who are immigrants and upcoming session will cover tribe and tribal residents, tenant protections, and mobile home parks. You can register for upcoming session using the same e-blast you receive reminder along the way. In addition, we will host two webinars focusing on urban housing and rural housing in March. Our public hearings will take place from mid-July through mid-August 2024. We are still finalizing dates and location for the public hearings. Please stay tuned for updates. Any changes to the state budget will be promptly communicated to you. We also have released a community needs assessment survey uh, on January 30th in multiple languages, including English, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Tagalog, and Vietnamese. The survey will remain available until April 1st, 2024. We encourage everyone to complete the survey and to encourage others to do the same. You can access the survey on ACD website. Simply visit the main page and select Begin Survey to choose the preference language. Uh, we will continue to mention it during any public meetings held until April 1st. And with that, I would turn uh, it over to my colleague, Veronica Katayama. Hey. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Veronica. Um, for those who have difficulty seeing me, I'm a white woman with brown wavy hair. It's pulled back in a ponytail today and I'm wearing a burgundy shirt. So now let's go ahead and take a look at some current data trends and existing conditions related to people who are immigrants. So this chart on your screen depicts the percentage of immigrants throughout the past 160 years. Those living in California are shown by the orange bars versus the percentage of immigrants living in the remainder of the United States that are shown by the blue bars. California is home to about 10.4 million immigrants, which accounts for about 23% of the foreign born population nationwide. Um, data from 2022 indicates that 27% of California's population was foreign born, which was the highest share of any state and more than double the percentage of the rest of the country. Really briefly, I'm just gonna pause for a moment. We have a comment that just came in, said that the, the screen is not showing. Um, can you guys give me a thumbs up if you can see the presentation screen? Okay, so Linda, I'm not sure if it's um, anything on your side, but I just wanted to let you know, it looks like people can see the, the presentation. Um, uh, so I'll move forward. Um, okay, so almost half of immigrants in California are from Latin America, but the majority of recent arrivals are actually from Asia. Our state has large numbers of immigrants from dozens of countries, including about 3.8 million people coming from our neighboring country of Mexico. This chart shows Asian immigrants depicted by the blue line, um, Latin American depicted by the orange line, and then the rest of the world depicted by the purple line. Among immigrants who arrived between 2013 and 2022, 51% were born in Asia, while 35% were born in Latin America, and um, immigrants are concentrated in our state's coastal counties, representing at least a third of the population in Santa Clara, San Mateo, Alameda, San Francisco, and Los Angeles counties. An important item to note is the impact that the pandemic had on California's immigrant population. Over 852,000 immigrants lost their jobs in the spring of 2020 and unfortunately made up the majority of the pandemic related deaths that year as well in 10 major industries. Um, those industries included agriculture, landscaping, food processing, food service, building service, warehousing, grocery, wholesale trade, and nursing care. Following that year, drought due to climate change negatively impacted the number of available jobs, which meant further income loss and displacement for immigrants. It's estimated that nearly 9,000 full-time and part-time jobs were lost in 2021 in the Central Valley, 
Russian River Basin and Northern Intermountain re uh, Valley regions due to drought. This tumultuousness within industries that immigrants have relied upon for income means that the immigrant population that our state also relies upon cannot afford to live here. Immigrants make significant contributions to the state's economy and are nearly twice as likely as U.S. born population to experience working poverty, which we'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide. Immigrants are more likely than native born residents to be cost burdened. And cost burdening is when more than 30% of a household's total income is spent on housing, which means that there's not much left over each month to spend on other necessities like food, clothing, utilities, and healthcare. Immigrants are also more likely to live in poor or hazardous housing conditions, such as exposure to high lead levels, poor insulation, and pest infestation. In an observational study, nearly half of the Mexican immigrant families' homes were observed to have dampness or mold, more than a quarter had pests, and more than 10% appeared to need uh, major repairs, such as having leaky pipes. Immigrant families are typically larger than the average U.S.-born families as well, and households tend to be a mixture of immediate and extended family members. Finding a home that can accommodate large households can be difficult due to limited income and resources, so immigrants are likely to live in situations of overcrowding, which is defined as ha having more than one person per room. This often causes families to choose between home quality and neighborhood safety versus finding a space that can accommodate their household size. Without a U.S. credit score, new immigrants typically also struggle to access financial products available to those with long credit histories or who were authorized on a friend or family member's credit card in order to build credit. This creates difficulty for immigrant families to secure mortgages, to obtain credit cards, or to even rent a home. If they had a credit score in their home country, it typically will not follow them to the US. In 2017, California passed the Immigrant Tenant Protection Act, which covered items that were not previously addressed. Prior to this act, laws did not directly address specific discrimination and retaliation that occurred based on immigration status after the start of tenancy. The 2017 act prohibits landlords from serving an eviction notice against an existing tenant because of that tenant's perceived or suspected immigration status. It also prohibits landlords from threatening to disclose an existing tenant's immigration or citizenship status uh, to immigration authorities Although a landlord may be required to disclose that information if they are directed to do so under federal law or by court order. This act also prohibits landlords from retaliating by reporting tenants to immigration authorities who have validly asserted their tenancy rights or have made habitability related complaints to the appropriate agency. These are a few items and by no means a comprehensive list of what's covered by that act. So if you feel that you've experienced an immigrant tem uh, tenant protection violation, please read about the act and um, to learn more about what all is covered by it and then reach out to the Civil Rights Department to follow their complaint process. Um, those links are available on the screen and we'll get these onto the website as well. So now we're gonna move right on into our feedback and listening session. So. On the next slide, um, we're going to share our discussion questions, and we ask that you provide us with your feedback in response to these questions. So I'll reiterate what Doug said earlier, that this is not a Q&A session where we're in a position to provide you with any answers about programs or services, but rather we're here to ask for your input to help shape the report that we're working on and help us set up some department fair housing goals for the coming years. Okay, so I'm also going to be launching these questions as individual polls where you can actually type in your answers uh, or answers, responses um, for those who prefer to respond that way. But I'll go ahead and read aloud the questions. So we want to know um, what's the biggest challenge immigrants face in finding and securing housing within immigrant communities, um, those who 
excuse me, um, those who are undocumented or, or who have limited English proficiency face additional hurdles. Um, have you experienced these difficulties? Housing for migrant workers is a critical housing issue for California. Do you have any experience regarding this issue that you can share with us? Have you ever lost your housing because of something related to immigration? And finally, have you ever wanted to live somewhere but couldn't? And was what prevented you from living there related to immigration status? So for anybody who would like to share your thoughts, go ahead and raise your Zoom hand and I'll call on you in the order in which they're received. Um, we'll get through as many speakers as we can today. And I really want to reiterate again how much we appreciate that you're willing to share your thoughts and your experiences with us today. So thank you for being here. Okay, I do see a couple of hands raised over here. And it looks like our first person here is Joseph. So go ahead and unmute Joseph. Joseph, are you able to unmute for us? Are you there? Okay, so Joseph, I'm gonna go ahead and move to our next person. Um, and then let's see if we can get your, your sound stuff figured out. Um, how about Sam? Sam, can you unmute? Sam, can you hear us? Are you unable? Are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, Joseph, it looks like you might have unmuted. Can you speak for us? Okay, it looks like we're having a little bit of difficulty here. I'm gonna try Ephraim. Can you unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You can? Yes, I can. Oh, perfect. Because um, I, I wasn't able to find a place to unmute myself, but I'm, I'm glad- Oh, you, you can't until you're called on. So it, it kind of goes in the order that people are raising their hands. Oh, no, no, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so I'm a community worker with California Rural Legal Assistance Central Valley. I've been here uh, 44 years working with farm workers, immigrant workers, right? And we just went to a, a commission here, here in Fresno County where, um, you know, they were trying to increase the rent, right? New, new owner comes in and they're trying to increase the rent. And, you know, farm workers are saying, hey, we can't afford, you know, the increase, you know. But then the commission at the same time is saying, well, you know, we'll consider it now. But later on, you know, it's going to be a challenge. You know, we're not going to be able to take into account your seasonal work you know that you're farm workers and and we're not going to be able to consider that so i mean that sounds like a challenge to me why you know they wouldn't even consider that because there, there's a lot of other issues that were raised as far as why you know the rent increase was was proposed but in this case you know we have seasonal farm workers here who are immigrants some of them speak misteco they don't even speak spanish you know and they're proposing the, uh like a 200 dollars rent increase which people are not working right now. They're working, uh, there's some citrus going on right now, but not here near in Fresno. People have to travel at least an hour away. So workers are not gonna be back to work until around May. But I just wanted to raise that as a concern. You know, the immigrants are facing those kind of uh, high rent uh, proposals at, at in, this, in this case, it would be a mobile home park. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that with us and bringing that to light. Um, we're also gonna have a, a mobile home discussion happening um, a couple sessions from now. Um, and we would welcome you to bring that to, to our attention there as well. But thank you very much for sharing that with us today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try Joseph. Are you able to unmute Joseph? I want to give it another shot. Okay. 
Okay, maybe no luck quite yet. Um, and Sam, I'll try you again. Okay, perhaps no luck with Sam either right now. Um, why don't I move on over to um, Amelia? Are you there, Amelia? So sorry about that. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Amelia Haney. I'm an attorney with California Rural Legal Assistance. I actually work in the same office as Ephraim. Um, I wanted to touch on, sorry, getting a phone call. I wanted to touch on um, the lack of affordable housing for farm workers in particular, because our office represents agricultural workers throughout the state and particularly in the Central Valley. Um, housing is very difficult to find, particularly in the rural communities where our clients usually live and work. And even when people are able to find affordable housing, we're seeing really terrible conditions. We've had cases where there's been overflowing septic tanks for more than a year. People are living without running water. There's severe overcrowding with multiple families and small homes. Um, so affordable housing and the poor conditions are really major challenges that we're seeing to our immigrant community here. As And secondly, I wanted to touch on fear around immigration threats. Um, we've had landlords threatening to call ICE or threatening to call the sheriff. And when I say landlords, I'm including public housing authorities who are threatening to call ICE on their tenants, on their immigrant tenants. Uh, landlords weaponize this fear to scare people into moving out without due process, so they don't go through the formal eviction process, they don't follow the proper notice procedures, they simply threaten to call ICE, and then people are too afraid to assert their due process rights. We've also seen this particularly in mixed status families in public housing, where even people with proper status are being threatened and being kicked out without due process. And of course, these kinds of threats, as you mentioned earlier, are illegal, but they still happen frequently. And the difficulty is that enforcement is only possible after people have already lost their homes. They can file a complaint with CCRD, but at that point, they've already lost their home. They've already moved out. And so it's very difficult for people to bring up these issues while they're still living there um, and face these kinds of threats and do anything in order to actually maintain their, their housing. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amelia. Okay. I still have Sam here. Sam, can you try to unmute? It doesn't seem to be happening for us still, Sam. Don't give up hope. Um, I'm going to move over to Nicole Mendoza, who has their hand up twice somehow. <laughs> okay, Nicole, you can unmute. Hi, um, this is from a keynote with Disability Rights California. Um, Nicole Mendoza is my supervisor, so maybe that's why um, both of our hands are raised okay. under the same account, um, okay. possibly. But I did want to say, I think, uh, jumping off of other folks, I think it's important to consider the challenges within mixed status families in particular, because some families may be ineligible for certain programs or face unique challenges because of their mixed statuses among household members. And I think this is important to take into account when evaluating criteria or program objectives. Those are issues I've seen within um, immigrant communities and I think is important to take into account. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with us today. I appreciate it. Okay, Nicole's other account. Thank you. Uh, this is Nicole Mendoza, pronoun she, her. I'm a senior attorney with Disability Rights California. In the last couple of years, I was living in Stockton, California, and I just want to build on what Amelia and Rome have already 
shared and and that's that like in addition to illegal threats to call ice what we've seen in the central valley and we've heard from community organizers like faith in the valley is that landlords will threaten also to call um, not threaten they will call cps and so there's this pattern of issuing the eviction and calling CPS at the same time. And that pressures folks to simply leave, um, leave their housing. And then in the, in the homeless context, in a place like Stockton, I was pretty overwhelmed by the number of retired farm workers who were homeless in the shelter and access to benefits is a huge issue. Even a program like CAPI, the cash assistance program for immigrants presents, which is supposed to be the equivalent of SSI for a person who's 65 or older or is disabled, meaning they are unable to work uh, competitively like nine to five Monday through Friday without any accommodations, um, even trying to get something like CAPI is pretty near impossible, depending on how the county individually administers that program. And so some homeless retired farm workers who are also immigrants, um, undocumented folks, uh, without any identification, couldn't get that basic cash assistance program for immigrants, even if they were 65. So like categorically eligible, they should just simply get it. But in trying to do that for someone, I was told I, I didn't have the proper identification for the individual. And so they couldn't even get that basic like $800 a month to to get out of homelessness. So, um, yeah, so just tacking those two examples on to what Amelia and Romay shared. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, I'm gonna pause here briefly. Um, it looks like we have Adriana and uh, Rosie following, but I wanna pause and go ahead and launch a poll it's just going to be that first question that we're asking, which is what is the biggest challenge immigrants face in finding and securing housing? Um, and I want to um, give everybody a few minutes to go ahead and start answering that. Um, so I'll go ahead and launch. Um, and I'll mute myself and I'll give everybody a few minutes to respond. Just a quick time check. We're going to be coming up on the two minute mark soon. So I'll close it a little while after that. I'll give you warning.
So we'll give it about 30 more seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close it. Okay, so I'm going to move over and um, call on Adriana. If you want to go ahead and unmute and share any thoughts with us. Hi, I'm Baron. Thanks uh, for giving me time to talk. My name is Adriana Brooks. My uh, current pronouns are she, her, and I have the honor of working in the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion unit here at HCD. Um, I just wanted to add in my uh, personal and professional, but mostly personal <laughs> experience, um, some of the challenges that I've witnessed are not just landlords threatening to fall ice, but just not fixing things that otherwise would be mandated that they have to fix because they know that that family is scared to report to like a state entity for fear of um, finding out um, that folks are undocumented. Even in like split status families, like they will just leave conditions completely unlivable and inaccessible because they rely on that fear. Um, and that can have a really big impact. And it also makes it super hard for folks to move to different housing, right? Because they feel like if they complain and then they want to move, then that landlord may give them like a, a negative reference or whatever. And so they'll have to be stuck. And so I've known quite a few friends that they're just really trapped because they or they feel trapped anyways especially when they're living in rural areas where they can't just like pop to downtown and meet with like the tenant folks that would tell them like hey it's okay that you're undocumented you can still make complaints um i just i don't know if this is helpful but i just feel like it's such an area of exploitation because Sometimes landlords will bend their rules, but then they hold that over them. So, for example, one of my friends, um, her husband is undocumented, and so he gets paid in cash. So this particular landlord allows him to pay in cash and not, like, require pay stubs. But then they have to put up with this landlord, like, not giving them the resources they need because they're working in this way. So I think sometimes these like strict practices of, you know, two months of pay stubs with no overdrawing and whatever has really, it exacerbates the challenges for a lot of folks. Um, yeah, and I think I said before, it just also, if you have any additional like struggles on top of that, it makes it really hard. Like if you have a disability, and your landlord refuses to install a lamp, or if you have kids and um, like one of my friends, they refuse to remove the lead paint because what are they gonna do? But then the kid tests high for lead exposure, you know? So there's a lot of areas I think um, where folks are being taken advantage of and hopefully we can find ways to kind of at least reduce that from happening. Thank you for listening. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay. And thank you, Rosie, for waiting. You can go ahead and unmute. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you to HCD for this seminar and all the ones that are that you've already had and the ones that are coming up. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to hear from others. 
and um, for you to provide us this this, this chance. Uh, my name is Rosy Rojo. I work for the City of Santa Maria and manage federal block grant funding. Um, Santa Maria is located in the northern end of Santa Barbara County. And um, I just want to also share, just like all those that have already spoken, we are seeing very, very similar things. Um, we're seeing uh, substandard housing. We're seeing um, landlords definitely taking advantage of um, immigrants, particularly those who are undocumented. Um, we're also seeing a huge um, language barrier, and uh, we have a high monolingual Spanish speaking population as well as Mixteco. And um, we try to work with as many nonprofits as possible so that we can reach out to the public because we are aware that many people do see government as um, maybe not the friendliest, um, especially if, if they're coming from, let's say, Mexico, where it's the government's not always there to help the citizens um, in their experience. So we are aware of that. But I do want to just add um, that I would be remiss if I didn't point out that um, as someone who works in government, um, that we sometimes make it really difficult for people to get the help that they need based because of the red tape associated with um, either the funding sources or just the way that government works. So if there's anything we can advocate for in the sense of trying to make it easier for people to get the help that they need without having to jump through the hoops that we currently make them jump through, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, because um, it's really tough to navigate this, even for those who speak English, let alone those who don't speak English um, and those who are not documented. So I just wanted to share that. And thank you so much. I appreciate you listening. Thank you for sharing with us, Rosie. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch poll number two. Um, Emily, hang tight for just a couple of minutes, if you will. Um, this second question is going to be um, within immigrant communities, those who are undocumented and or who have limited English proficiency right on the heels of what Rosie was just talking about, face additional hurdles. Um, have you experienced these difficulties? I'll go ahead and launch this and I'll leave it up for a few minutes, okay? Just a quick time check. We're coming up on two minutes, so I'll leave it up for another minute or so, but I'll let you know before I'm going to close it.
Okay, I'm going to close it in about 20 seconds. All right, thank you everybody who contributed to that. Um, I will go ahead and call on Emily if you'd like to unmute and speak. Hi, thank you. I'm, um, my name's Emily Hislop. I'm with the city of San Jose, uh, division manager in the housing department overseeing rent stabilization and eviction prevention. I wanna echo a lot of what we've heard um, from the participants so far about challenges in um, or immigrant populations um, face and just highlight some of the, the bigger challenges um, that we're working to overcome, but um, our trust in government so we can pass protections and policies and try to educate um, our communities, but trusting that those policies will work or that the government is actually enforcing them has been um, a hurdle we've had to address. Another um, Another issue that we're, we're trying to get over is how we share information. It's not just translation, but putting it in simple, in ways that people might understand culturally. Um, so you can literally translate something, but you may not get the message across or people might not fully understand. Um, an additional challenge, uh, I think I mentioned this, but is we're finding that there's you know, some who have access to our services for enforcement, um, you know, of conditions in their unit, um, but they may not be able to understand the decision. Even if it's translated, they may have little to no literacy. And we as government employees are not, we can't interpret things for them. So that leads to the other challenge of um, there's a serious lack of uh, legal aid attorneys out there there's funding that's being secured, but there's there's some other systemic issues. Um, and uh, that's a challenge we have is that these laws may not be followed, but we may not be in a position and we really need to get um, our immigrant community access to, to legal assistance. And um, they're very strapped, particularly in the Bay Area and the services they can provide are very limited um, and, and trying to help these communities advocate for some, themselves is, an additional challenge because of that. Thank you for letting us share. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Emily. I don't have any hands up in the queue right now. Yes, I do. Carla, you want to unmute? Hey, everyone. <clears throat> Carla Guerra. Um, I am the policy and advocacy senior manager at the Unity Council. But I wanted to share a bit of my story. I came to the US about five years ago. So I am an immigrant myself. I came here through a fellowship. And one of the first things that I encountered when trying to secure some housing was the fact that I did not have any credit on this country. And so I was looking around and everyone was asking, you know, for my credit score. And to start with, I didn't even know what a credit score was. Like nobody had told me this is the way that you do get credit. And so I had to figure it out on my own, you know, through experience, what credit meant. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I need to get some credit. How do I get some credit as an immigrant? So the process was really complicated. And then when I tried, you'd open a credit card, you know, to start creating some credit. Guess what? Nobody wanted to give me a credit card because I had no credit. <laughs> so it's like a cycle of confusion. And I had to figure out a system, you know, basically I had savings and those savings were, I think, more than what a credit card could give you. And so because of that, there was only one bank, because I applied for like three or four, that actually decided to provide me with my first credit card. But there was a loophole in that. And the loophole was that because I had enough savings, they could trust me with giving me a credit card. But if I had no saving whatsoever, then probably that's the case for a lot of their immigrant communities uh, that are living paycheck to paycheck, right? There's basically no way of getting credit if you don't have no credit. So I finally got my first credit card. And then they told me that I had to wait about six months to build credit. 
And once I did that, you know, I was allowed to apply now for more form formal housing. I think the other part of this and the challenge in the Bay Area, specifically here in California, is the fact that housing is so expensive. So there's a lot of people renting rooms, right? And so uh, when they see that a person is an immigrant and maybe have an has an accent, um, and they don't really know this person, it doesn't feel or makes make feel that people sometimes renting out the rooms that you're part of that community, right? And so you get a little bit of discrimination, I will say, because they want someone that has a trajectory of being in the community and is also looking to rent long-term. But we have to remember that these communities, some of them are day laborers. And so some of them get, get money and paychecks, you know, by the date that they work. So they don't know if next week, you know, they're gonna have an income or not. And some of these people are requiring you to prove with papers, right, and documents how much money you make. But if you are a day laborer, then you cannot get proof of income in that part. So I'm just going to share my story. I have my own apartment now. <laughs> it took me, like I said, trying to figure out loopholes. But I wish that the immigrant community, you know, will have the tools. Uh, and at this, you know, a presentation like this saying, what are your challenges? And then referring them potentially to community partners that could help them overcome those challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch poll three. And the question is going to be asking, housing for migrant workers is a critical housing issue for California. Do you have experience regarding this issue that you can share? I'll go ahead and launch it and I'll let you know when a couple of minutes have passed. We're coming up on the two minute mark shortly and I'll let it run for another minute or so after that. Okay, I'm going to give it probably 20, 25 more seconds.
Okay, thank you all for participating. I'm going to go ahead and um, call on Amelia. Go on, unmute. Hello again. Um, this is Amelia with California Rural Legal Assistance. I just wanted to speak to number three regarding migrant workers. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, sorry, my computer went completely black for a moment. Um, anyway, so there's a, a growing number of temporary agricultural workers who are coming to California um, on temporary visas to work specifically for one employer. Those employers are required to provide housing to them. So often they end up in overcrowded motels and hotels in really rural areas. Um, and all of their housing is supposed to be inspected to make sure that it's up to proper standards and is safe and sanitary. But often it's going uninspected and the Employment Development Department is allowing employers to sort of self-certify that the housing is up to the standards, which results in hundreds of workers living in really substandard conditions. Uh, another issue with the temporary agricultural visa workers is that they're now allowed to live in public housing, um, publicly subsidized housing, which is of course supposed to be for low income individuals and families. But ultimately it's the employer's responsibility to provide and pay for this housing. And the employers are these big growers and contractors who are in no way low income. So it baffles me how they are able to qualify for that. And it takes housing away from local communities and puts those two groups, the visa workers and the locals, in this sort of competition that is kind of a false dichotomy because ultimately it's the employer's responsibility to provide that housing. And it's the employers who are taking advantage of this very limited public resource instead of coming up with their own solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Okay, with no other hands up at the moment, I'm going to go ahead and launch poll number four. Actually, I'll call on you, Adriana, first. You want to go ahead and unmute? Sorry, I didn't realize I didn't pull my hand up. Um, I just wanted to build on what Ashley, I think that was Ashley, was saying um, that housing for migrant workers supplied by employers, I feel like housing is a pretty generous term to describe the conditions that a lot of folks are living in. Um, as Ashley mentioned, and I just wanted to point out some like specific barriers that um, I've noticed, like no access to internet. So people can't communicate with their families or even like figure out how to access services there's usually a lack of transportation. So folks are super isolated to their like quote unquote housing areas, um, which can just, you know, besides being really isolating, it means they may not have access to healthy foods or foods that are specific to their culture or um, any other resources specific to their cultural traditions. I've also noticed that a lot of times this housing does not consider the needs of children or aging folks. So it's like really not accessible in those ways. And it's really hard then for families to be separated, you know, because then they can't find additional housing just for them. So it's a lot of times just like this bare minimum where folks are barely being treated as human. Like it's just it can be really abhorrent. And then um, uh, also one thing I've noticed is um, like Ash, uh, now I don't remember, but uh, mixed tech folks, the their language is really not written. It's much more oral. And so even providing things um, in mixed tech may not actually reach the population. And that's just an example of like, you can't apply one strategy to all immigrants and think that that's going to work. That's not equitable. We really have to like research the intricacies of different populations so that we're communicating in an equitable way rather than just like a same equal way. Um, one example of this, if anyone is interested, is 
Um, in 2017, for the Sonoma complex fires, there are a lot of farm workers there. And when the county sent out the emergency response for evacuation, they sent it in English. And then when they sent it in Spanish, they only used Google Translate. So they were trying to warn folks to evacuate. But brush fire in Spanish on Google Translate came out to Cepillo, which is like a hairbrush. So people didn't realize like the urgency of evacuating. And then folks, um, mixed tech folks in Ventura experienced the same problem because it was written A in Spanish and B, there was no like link to a video of someone from their community explaining um, like the emergency, but also following things like services that are available or the um, folks weren't supposed to be Folks were supposed to be boiling their water because of the ash runoff. And the state didn't even post that in Spanish for 10 days. And then it was only in Spanish. So just a few things to consider in terms of like timing, who's there, cultural considerations, and like really focusing on equity versus equality. I hope I didn't take up too much space for speaking again. So thank you for no, calling on me again. Thank you very much for sharing that. Okay, I'll go ahead and launch the fourth question, which is, have you ever lost your housing because of something related to immigration? I'll come in with a reminder around the two minute mark. It's been about two minutes. I'll give it about another minute. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this one. And we don't have 
any hands up right now, so I'll go ahead and launch right into the fifth um, question, which is, have you ever wanted to live somewhere but couldn't? Was what prevented you from living there related to immigration status? coming up on the two minute mark for this question. So I'll give it another minute or so after that. Okay, so I'll go ahead and close this poll. And right now we also don't have any hands up. So we'll stick around here for another couple of minutes. If anybody, um, I see Christina, I'm going to call you in just one second. Um, if anyone has any additional thoughts um, related or unrelated to this subject, you can raise your hand and talk to us about it. Um, I'll go ahead and call on Christina right now. You want to go ahead and unmute Christina? Yeah, hi there. Uh, my name is Christina Gotuaco. Uh, thanks for this call. I've been dialing in and these sessions have all been great to hear from people. Um, I just wanted to share. So my parents were immigrants and when they moved here, one of the first housing um, opportunities that they tried to live in was um, this older couple had extra space in their home. So in exchange for my parents being the driver and the cook for them, they would reduce the cost of their housing. So they lived there for a bit, but then it it kind of became like indentured servitude a little because they had to provide these services. And then like, where was the line drawn? And then it was, it was in exchange for discounted housing. So just tying the housing to the employment was a little concerning in that in that scenario, and they ended up moving out of there. Um, um, but yeah, so I had been talking with my coworkers about how, like, what is the opportunity for freeing up space in housing that 
like where there is a senior who is living alone in a big house and does want to share space with some, you know, people. And if there's a way that they can be connected with like perhaps immigrant families, but not necessarily in exchange for services, like just a separate scenario where they're renting out part of their house to an immigrant family and like not necessarily like individual roommates or something. So there's, it seems like there's no resource out there to make that kind of connection currently. Um, and then just on a different topic, I'm from San Mateo County and I know that like after the Half Moon Bay mass shooting, uh, they, I just want to commend the Board of Supervisors for really taking action and starting to build affordable housing for farm workers and realizing that it's not necessarily in the, like, it's not the expertise of farmer, uh, farm operators to also provide housing. So they're like stepping in to have affordable housing provided by affordable housing providers for the workers and then having some sort of partnership connection. So I think that's a really successful model and hope to see other counties doing that as well. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call on Nicole or a member of Nicole's team. Hi, this is Nicole again, and I want to echo what someone said. Her name, I believe her name was uh, something Salas in the last disability listening session. And, and that was that for farm workers, um, you know, they don't necessarily have access um, to the time during the week to come to one of these meetings um, and and also really these should be held in um, different languages for um, for the community so and and possibly like in the evening or on the weekend to truly give, uh, migrant farm workers, farm workers, immigrant families, the opportunity to give feedback directly to HCD. And I know it's tough, um, but I think the best story, and we've heard a lot of great stories today, but I think hearing from those who are experiencing the issues directly is is just so much more powerful and so a a Spanish session and um, a session that's during the evening or on a, a weekend would probably be uh, more accessible for this population. Thank you very much Nicole we appreciate that. Okay, so right now I don't see any additional hands raised. Like you said, we'll hang tight here for a few minutes. I want to give anybody who wants to speak an opportunity to speak. So if you decide to raise your hand, then we'll go ahead and call on you. Um, but we'll hang tight here for a few minutes just to make sure that everybody gets that opportunity. I'm fearful that I'm going to pronounce this very incorrectly, but Algeli? You got it. Algeli. Okay. Yes. That usually never happens, but thank you. <laughs> um, I'm I'm from the office of Assembly Member Greg Hart, uh, here in the district office in Santa Barbara. Um, I'm also a new immigrant and I echo a lot of the uh, comments that were made, you know, challenges in getting housing, um, especially that one person who said that credit history, because that's true, I'm from the Philippines, we don't use credit history there. So that was really new to me and something that I had to navigate. You know, luckily, I'm with people who are, you know, knowledgeable about this issue, and I'm able to also comprehend it. And that was fine. Um, but also, I think, even if you have cash with you, um, 
immigrants typically are not allowed to bring that much cash when coming into America. There's only a certain amount, and I'm not sure what, how much it is, but there's only a certain amount that you can bring with you. And so even that to be cash strapped and some of this um, lease, residential leases, um, would require, you know, months in advance, including deposit. So that's that's really hard. Um, I know that California has just passed a law that would limit the security deposit to only one month, whether it is um, furnished or unfurnished. So I hope that, you know, that will create some positive impact, especially for the immigrant communities, because I didn't have it back then, but I, I'm sure that that's that's going to be helpful. And yeah, it's it's a new law. I think it's just about to be implemented this year or starting this year. So uh, yeah, I, I hope that gets rolled down to our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. And it looks like um, Rosie is mentioning that, um, that that rule starts July 1st. Okay, so again, we'll hang tight in case anybody decides to raise their hand and add any additional thoughts or comments. Okay, so I don't see any additional hands raised. We can go ahead and conclude the session, but if anything pops into your mind after this, um, or you just are taking time to maybe formulate a thought, go ahead and please email it to us at aifairhousingreport at hcd.ca.gov. Any of your thoughts related to this subject, go ahead and send over there, aifairhousingreport at hcd.ca.gov. Thank you all so much for coming today. We really appreciate your time and we hope that you'll join us for next week's session as well. Thank you.